Stephen, you, you work in a philosophy department. Some of us went, took philosophy classes where we did a lot of thinking in a very cool and not aesthetic way. What, what's up with that? Was that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, certainly uh, philosophers you know, are rightly, I think, accused of uh, emphasizing the frontal part of the brain to the exclusion of all, of all else historically. Although there are certainly important historical uh, uh, counterexamples to that. So for example, much of what contemporary moral psychology emphasizes with the role of emotion uh, is what David Hume emphasized in, in his uh, theory of ethics as well. So the, the debates that we find in, in philosophy and in, are in, in a way mirrored in contemporary work, work and uh, can kind of interact with each other to find insight and, and inspiration. So there are both examples of uh, extreme over-reliance on reason within philosophy to the exclusion of all else. There are more nuanced perspectives as well. And I think ultimately what we'll see is a uh, reconciliation between deliberation and intuition to see where and when the brain uses uh, different strategies, how those strategies uh, are integrated, what happens when there's conflict between them. Uh, if anything, I think kind of from philosophy, you know, philosophers like to think of uh, what are deep unifying principles to come up with a, a general theory that we, we're seeing the brain really more now as a, essentially a value machine. Our brain is computing value uh, at every, you know, every fraction of a second. Everything we look at, we form an implicit preference. Some of those make it up into our awareness, some of them remain at the level of our, uh, of our unconscious. But it's the, uh, the, the notion that what our brain is for, what it evolved for, is to find what's of value in our environment, to uh, be able to see what are things that have ad adaptive capacity, what things uh, hinder that, allow us to make these computations very quickly. And actually, I think, in part, what we're finding also is that the intuitive components that we've, we've been discussing so far are, in fact, actually computationally much more sophisticated than we would have supposed. So that when we think about what is a deliberative component, what is an intuitive component, that those intuitive components are sometimes even far more complex than what we think of as the deliberative component in the brain. Could I just add something onto that? Um, in terms of the, the, the resolution of the deliberation and the intuitive uh, aspects of, of thinking, I think a problem in, in scientific work throughout the 20th century has been the focus on individualism for a variety of reasons, moral and historical reasons, and also just methodological reasons. As, as scientists, it's really a lot easier to study one person uh, in the lab or in a scanner than to study uh, groups. But uh, maybe we'll get to this later in the talk, but I think we have to see our intelligence as having evolved uh, in a group context where groups solve problems in much the way that neurons solve problems by getting together. Each neuron's really dumb, but you put them together and, and you get genius. Um, and um, <laughs> um, Not in my world. Uh, uh, okay. yeah. Well, I guess if you put, right, yeah. neurons, but if, if neurons can be at each other's throats, then maybe it doesn't work so well. I don't, I don't know how, what happened with that metaphor. But I just want to make the point that I think the, the human intelligence, really, we should be, really be looking at it much more in terms of how do we design systems and groups. And I think the legal system, and Mike's heading an issue on this now, looking at the legal system as a case where each individual agent isn't, might not be doing a very good job, but if you set it up in the right way, it'll do a pretty good job overall. I, I want to get to groups later, but just to finish off this earlier emphasis on fast processes, how do we think about the, you, you said, you all agree there's a relationship between the slow, more conscious, and more rational processes and the fast processes. How should we conceptualize the relationship to those two things? When I go into the work in the, the New York Times Bureau in Washington, I, my office is next to Maureen and Tom Friedman in what I call Ego Alley. And, <laughs> and, and of course, I naturally, my first instinct every day is to strangle Tom for his three Pulitzers, his books which have sold 800 million copies, uh, and yet I don't do it so far. Uh, now, is my coldly rational process, is that, I think you've described it as a lawyer, which will go along with my instincts until my instincts or my intuitions are totally crazy, or is, it, or, or is this process more powerful than that? Or some of the things you've written suggest maybe it's even less powerful than that, that it's a confabulator of, and it just follows along. How, how do we conceptualize the relationship between these two processes? 
It, it's an ongoing um, dynamic between the two. I mean, there are uh, different ways you might uh, uh, think about Tom. Uh, <laughs> I, you see me after class and I'll uh, show you. I'm sorry to air my deep envy and resentment. But, but uh, uh, if you if you were put into a, a, a different mental set about to someone, if you uh, had had a prior uh, unfortunate event that morning on the way to work, your thought about him might be wrong. And your interpretation of why you're feeling different is going to be instantaneously and related to the summed input at the moment you're trying to think about whatever it is. And so it's not that it's a set deal. It's not that it's a, a, a rigid uh, 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 cast in stone kind of thing. It's a constant dynamic interaction between your experience, variable expression of mood states due to a, a vast biology that's supporting all of this in you and me, and uh, then your interpretation of all that. And that interpretation becomes your, your narrative, which can, which can be, become a theory, which can feed back and influence all those systems that are, right. are being modulated by it. So right. it's a, it's a, I mean, you get that kind of concept. I think it's, okay. I was just going to add, I think also it's important that um, oftentimes, although it's thought of as a, essentially a conflict between automatic and deliberative processes, that it's typically, I think, much more collaborative in, in the sense that we need our attention is, is extremely limited. Our capacity for attention is limited. And if we had to pay attention to every mundane thing in our environment to operate, you know, the, the tiger could sneak up behind us. And so our, our, our brain offloads things into automatic processes when we've learned enough about daily kinds of routines and when we can allow what we typically think of as habit systems to let us navigate a learned environment, to keep our attention free for the, for the detection of the novel. And so they really interact at all times between each other. Um, typically, you know, things like signals like uncertainty, for example. When we get in an environment where the automatic processes no longer operate properly because there's some element of novelty that they are prepared for, it tells us it's time to you know, bring, the, uh, bring the frontal lobes online to learn how to uh, navigate this environment. So although we like to think about it you know, as being a, a, a conflict between the two, both are absolutely essential uh, for, for regular uh, adaptive cognition. Okay.